The Cure Chronicles is honored to welcome Joseph Kibler to the show. Joseph was born with HIV and developed a physical impairment due to his prognosis. Doctors told him he would never live past the age of four. But Joseph defied all odds and today is a successful actor, producer, writer, and HIV activist. Joseph also wrote and starred in his own documentary titled Walk On, where he trained for the 6.2-mile L.A. AIDS Walk. His documentary went on to win the Best Documentary Award from the Burbank International Film Festival and Timecode NOLA Film Festival. Joseph, thank you so much for being with us here on the HIV Cure Chronicles. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, you have a fascinating story, I got to say, and... and and just a series of amazing accomplishments. And I got to, you know, one thing I, I noted right away when I was looking at your background is this is the first time I've ever gotten the chance to talk to somebody with an IMDB, uh, you know, bio um, and so many accomplishments in, you know, uh, film and acting and, and stuff like that. And if you don't mind, let me just start there. I mean, I know that, you know, one, one of your award will, winning films was Walk On. Yes. which uh yeah which is about this subject but if you don't mind can you tell us a little bit about you know sort of how you got into that and you know walk on and and, and how people are reacting to that yeah so um back in 2011 uh at the tail end of film school i was you know studying filmmaking and producing and everyone gets a thesis project that they have to work on and so i you know was working on other people's projects as a producer and I was trying to think about what I wanted to do for mine and you know as somebody who was I was born HIV positive and I've been around that world so often um every year there's the AIDS walks AIDS walks across America and I wanted to go and initially what it was supposed to be was I wanted to go and talk to people why they go to the walk what do they do why do they come out and I wanted to interview different people and I had a great uh, filmmaking teacher at the time who was guiding us, who I told this to. And he was kind of perplexed because he was like, why does this guy with cerebral palsy, which I also have as a disability, want to go interview people about HIV and about, and about AIDS and the AIDS walk? And he didn't know my background. And so I was like, well, I was born HIV positive And, you know, I was told I was never going to live past this point in my life at four years old. And I wanted to, you know, I always wanted to do the walk and I gave all these different details of my life and he just plainly looks at me and he goes, Joseph, that's the film. That's what you need to do. Don't go interviewing other people. That's what be we your story. Do. Yeah. Yeah. And what was supposed to be a thesis, like a five minute thesis turned out to, we just did a trailer and he actually came on board as the director and we just took it beyond film school and we started filming for about a year and a half, two years, and we just focused it on HIV and disabilities and overcoming these obstacles. And it followed me doing the AIDS walk, which was 6.2 miles, and it be just steamrolled. And uh, if you're ever part of a documentary, you, you really quickly learn that you're not allowed to have any privacy in your life. And if you're going to be an open person, you better be open. And we had to start out that venture together and he had to look at me and go, look, I'm going to have to take my friend hat off. I'm going to have to take my teacher hat off. And I'm going to have to be a director with you. And so that means there's going to be moments that are very tough, that are very personal. And I'm going to have to push past that, what I would want for you as a person, so that we can get these core elements into the film, these emotional yeah. raw moments, yeah. you know, and we had many of them. Um you know, and it was just one of those experiences where I really, I poured my heart out into it. Yeah. And we interviewed people like, you know, again, as somebody who was born in HIV positive, we had one interviewer who he gave himself HIV because he, purpose? he, he on purpose, he wanted to end his life. And I had no idea ahead of time. Talk about getting an interview. It's an unusual way to want to end one's life, you know, to he die wanted, of from HIV, you got to go through AIDS. Yes. Right? He wanted just the punishment. Wanted to punish and, huh. and it was just this baffling moment. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm just like trying to hold back all this emotion of somebody who had no choice in the matter. You know, I was born into it. And here's this person across from me who is willing to just go through all of it. 
And I mean, it was a life-changing uh, process. That film took me and we took it all across America. We went to film festivals and I got to really open up. And what I learned from that, which was amazing, is when you open up to other people, they open up back to you. Right. And the stories that I learned during that film festival tour, the people I connected with, they told me things they hadn't told their like their family. They told me things that they couldn't open up to their closest friends because they felt that I was so vulnerable in that moment that I allowed that to happen. And it was a good life lesson to be open to everyone. You know, it's really interesting because, you know, even what you're saying has something to do with breaking the stigma of HIV and that, you know, uh, once more people are open and I'm not, you know, trying to tell people to do that if they're not ready for it, but, you know, and, and the public gets more used to that and some of the barriers come down and, you know, folks will actually connect to the tremendous amount of commonality between this challenge and every life challenge. And you've got a whole stack of them, right? You know, this is, your story is really engageable, you know, because, you you know, sure the HIV angle, but, you know, you've had to overcome the, the fact that people didn't even think you'd live past four, that you would never walk, you know, now here you are a, um, a, a decorated film producer and star, right? And, um, you know, so your, your old teacher was right that telling your truth is powerful, right? That's where we get connections from is we, we show our real selves. And then it, and sometimes it's the first time anybody's ever seen a real person, right? Yeah. yeah, amazing. But boy, I can absolutely empathize with your journey of having to be that open. I know how hard it is to, you know, sometimes in the things that aren't just your Facebook moments where, you know, all positive stuff that of course you want to tell everybody, no, just to, to tell everybody that like, yeah, you know, you have the ups and downs that everybody experiences. I, I think the openness um, for me was, you know, I spent so much of my life, um, my early years, um, teenage years, childhood, uh, not allowed to be open, not allowed to speak up. So that was a big thing for me going into my adulthood and coming into myself was to find truth and be honest and be blunt, frankly. Um, and to be fearless. Yeah. Because right? that's the thing. What prevents us from being ourselves? The fear of what other people's reactions will be. And sometimes until you go ahead and take that step, you don't know what you're really going to see in return. And it sounds like you saw a ton of goodwill that came back. Oh, yeah. I always say uh, HIV and my disability are like these great filtration systems for people and engagement. And, you know, you may have less friends, you may have less people in your life, but you actually don't. You have a greater amount of fulfilling friendships and greater amount of fulfilling people in your life because those who stick around to be there with you, those who support you are the ones you actually want in your life. So often people s stick with friendships or, or love, you know, love interests. And they don't actually connect and they don't realize it because they're not opening up on a pure level. And they don't when, get what they're missing. They don't yeah. get what you're missing. And then when you're, when you're doing this is too that, easy. Yeah. <laughs> they're doing it because they want to share activities as opposed to because they want to share their essence of their souls exactly. with one another, which is really like, you know, when you get a chance to connect with somebody like that, you know, you realize like everything else is just surface. It's life changing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's amazing. And I've heard this from, from other people on these interviews, that idea of the natural filtration system, that through their openness, they naturally filtered, you know, their uh, contacts to the really high quality contacts, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that openness created a new connection and, and that the limitation of not having those other people in their life was no limitation at all. Yeah. It was actually a good thing. But, you know, I think your situation is really unusual, you know, to like put your life in a film and to to bear yourself in that way. You know, that is really, you know, that's sort of the pan ultimate version of what I'm thinking about. I, I don't imagine that I've ever had that experience myself, even though I've always tried to, you know, go out there and always tell my truth, uh, you know, despite what people think about it. It, you know, it's it's really different when you've got something where there's a big stigma attached Yes. And you're doing it on film with a director who is actually making a point of digging down to those soft spots and bringing out those, you know, those emotions that you might 
feel very uncomfortable expressing. Oh yeah, and I lived with it. We lived, I mean, we did, you know, we spent a year, a year and a half editing it. And so sitting there every day in front of the camera, re-watching myself crying or re-watching myself go through these emotions, you have to step back and you have to realize, like, you know, um just in general in filmmaking, there's the film you write, there's the film you shoot, and the film you edit. And I think with you know, documentaries and with life in general, there's like the thing you set out to, to do, the thing you actually do, and the thing you reflect upon. Right. And you know, wow. you have to be able to separate and realize what you're doing and do it for the better. And you know, um, I, again, I've just always been somebody who every year I've tried to get closer and closer to my true self and as honest as I can get. And I think, you know, that's, and as an actor, that's the ultimate goal is like, you know, if I always found that being an actor, you can't start delving into other personalities and other characters and other worlds and other lives if you've not delved into yourself. If you haven't opened up who you are, you can't start to transform into anyone else because yeah. you're not allowing room for that and you're not uh, challenging yourself. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'm just, my, my brain is full of thoughts. Like, so first of all, your, your little thing about, you know, what you set out to do, what you what you capture, and then what you reflect on. It means that, you know, every film work of art is actually three works of art in it, which is amazing to me. Like, I love that. Uh, you know, I'd never had thought about that before, because film is my absolute favorite art form, because I think that it has the ability to capture so much. Like, I can go to a film and I can live somebody else's life. But then the next thing that you said is also remarkable to me, because Yes, until you have delved into the full range of human emotions that already exist in you, your ability to empathize and create the conditions in your own body to become another journey and to reflect that in a real way, right? Like great actors become yeah. their subjects. And you go, well, how is that even possible? And the only thing I can think is that, well, in reality, if you if you can explore oneself you realize there's a universe within and then you have all those those emotions all those foibles all those ups all those downs all those experiences inside you to different degrees and you can call on them when yeah, you whether you're writing something else yeah whether you're writing or acting you still have to find the truth and it doesn't matter if it's science fiction if it's drama if it's comedy everything starts from a sense of truth everything yes. has to start from some place Yes. Oh and my so gosh. You have to, you're you know, blowing my mind here. Joseph. <laughs> I mean, because I always thought that that's what makes great art truth. Yeah. Truth is beauty and beauty is truth. Right. The yeah. idea is, is that, you know, somebody will connect with your truth and they will have an experience that is far beyond the message. It is, it will cut right to the soul mm -hmm. because only art can do that. And you just said it yourself. It's like your truth. Right? Yeah, and art is, you know, I always talk about this being other actors and being in the community. And it's it's not a sense of competition. You know, a lot of actors want to think of it this way of like, oh, you know, am I better or am I worse? Am I be it's not better or worse. It's different. And it's close to you. When you get a character breakdown, when you get, you know, this is the role you're getting. Uh, what people do, I, I personally, I think people do wrong is they try to exactly match that breakdown and just be this other thing. And not being like, okay, what can I do with this? How can I make it me? And therefore, how do I just show up? And this is my interpretation. If this works for you, if this connects to the character and the project, wonderful. If it doesn't and someone else had a better interpretation or a different interpretation that fits it, wonderful. When you're trying to all do the same thing, you're not being honest and you're not doing it because you feel that this is the right thing. You're doing it to fit a mold that you can't possibly fit into. You know, every human being is so unique. And so you just have to come at it from your perspective. And I think the great actors out there, you remember them or you think about them because of who they are as people. And that's, you know, you know, who they- well, I think also, you know, you can see that like, yeah, you know, you become the material on the canvas, which becomes something new, right? Yes. And, uh, and I get it that, yeah, your ability to pull something out real from your yourself and to push it through that character that you're playing, that's going to make that connection possible. Yes. And, and, and I think you're right. I guess there's a little piece of you in everything that you play. And then the question is, is how well do we get to know these people behind those roles? 
right? Because I always think, okay, yeah, Meryl Streep, you know, I think I know her, but no, I don't know her, right? But she somehow can, you know, mold herself into all these different things. There are, you know, a lot of actors out there that, and sometimes they're, you know, Meryl Streep obviously, you know, achieved amazing things, but, you know, not all actors will necessarily, you know, sort of achieve that level of success. But at the same time, you can see these performances that just literally just, like I said, they just reach right past, right through your skin, you know, and engage you in a way. And you go like every once in a while, I'm like, oh, that's acting. I was there. You know, I was feeling him. I was feeling her. I, I, I felt like I was there with them. I was empathizing in a way where I couldn't have done it without this film. Yes, that's that's great stuff. And, and your film Walk On, obviously, with all the awards that it got, you know, that is, uh, you know, it must be a must see for people to understand, you know, your journey, but also, you know, that this is an important thing in terms of breaking down uh, stigma around HIV for people to go ahead and have that experience and to cry with you and to laugh yes. with you and, uh, you know, go through the challenge. They and can do of, it there. Huh? Yeah. And part of why I started speaking out so much about it was because of what it did breaking the stigma, which also goes into another thing. But first, you know, I was, people don't often know that you can be born with HIV. People don't often know that that side of it, you know, they have a very specific stigma in their head. Right. You know, for me, I was as, you know, I'm, I'm now pansexual and I've, I've come out since, um, but when I was doing the film and as a, a teenager and an early adulthood, I was heterosexual and I presented as heterosexual and I wanted to so much tell people like, hey, I'm born HIV positive, I'm heterosexual, I'm exactly the type of thing that you're not thinking about when it comes to HIV and this is why it's important. And I felt like just existing in my body, existing out in the world was an educational tool. And you know, when I was a kid, you know, I found out I was HIV positive at, at 11 and I found out by accident. Um, cause my doctor who was my primary wasn't there and I had a new doctor and my mom hadn't gotten to tell them that they didn't, that I didn't know. And so wow. the doctor let it slip. My mom had to explain to me on the car ride home what it meant. HIV was. What HIV yeah. was. What does that mean for me and how life were and, and that I can't tell anyone because okay, kids get 11. Protested. I'm trying to do the math here. So yeah. you born in like 85? I was I born in 89. 89. Okay. Yeah. So, I was diagnosed in 90. Yeah. Uh, HIV med since but 19. At 2000. Thank yeah. goodness, you know, everybody knew that it was treatable at that point and yes. that you could live a normal length life. So your mother would be able to reassure you of that. But I mean, this is like finding out by accident you're adopted, right? Yeah. I mean, this is like a life changing yeah. perspective. And I was told that I couldn't talk about it. And I was told I couldn't speak about it's it because we were getting protested against. Kids right, were getting right. kicked out of school. And so I was are scared. Yeah, because they were afraid yeah, for their and for no reason. Yeah. Amazing. They didn't know. And so I held on to that for seven years. Yeah. From that point where I couldn't talk to anyone about it. I couldn't speak about it. And I actually, the reason I got into acting, the reason I got into this world is because uh, when I was 18, I went to a theater camp. And if you've done theater, it's like therapy. You know, acting is like therapy. And one of the exercises they wanted you to do was to go on stage and to your peers, tell them something you've never told anyone before. That right. was, and I was like, you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired of holding this in. This is most of who I am as a human being and I can't express it. And I went up there and I said, my name is Joseph Kibor and I'm HIV positive. And the support, and the life it gave me, theater gave me life, and I gave my life to theater. Oh, right, and, because you are in a group of people, right, that have just such open minds because they're playing, like, again, you know, they're painting a universe. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, what a great opportunity to come out in a supportive environment like that. Fortunately, a lot of the stories that I've heard with people coming out uh, were quite positive. Right. Yeah. They, you know, sometimes you'd hear you you'd hear a negative one. And and there's certainly I don't think that there's anybody who has been open about their status who's never encountered some level of stigma and prejudice. Right? Oh, 100 percent. <laughs> yeah. So we got to be real about that. But but the reality, you know, but the other side of that reality is that 
yeah, you know, maybe the world is ready to understand that, you know, if somebody is dealing with a, an HIV diagnosis, that's their private thing in a way. It doesn't affect the people around them. You know, there's no danger to those folks. There's no reason for you to even presume, like you were saying, you know, the first thing people go is like, oh, okay, are you gay? Right. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, no, fact, that's not true either. Wrapped in that. And it was so hard to like, for me, it was personally hard to come out as pansexual because I wrapped my identity around this idea of breaking stigma. Right. And so I was so afraid that by become by being my true self, again, by opening up about being pansexual, suddenly the thing I had to tell people to change their mind would be like, oh, they would jump ahead and they'd be like, okay, pansexual, HIV, I know your story before you've even gotten into it. And this idea of like, I wanted to be able to break it up and break that stigma. You, and, but when you were being that other person, right, that heterosexual with HIV, did you realize you were pansexual then? Or was that an, uh, something you recognized later? I re I recognized it early in my teen years and I kind of fought against it because again, I was, I mean, as, as many things, as a lot of people who don't come out until later, you know, you try to second guess it. You Sometimes, to, so, yeah. Some people don't necessarily believe, you know, that what they're feeling is real, but you had a feeling at that point already. And then later you realize, okay, this is real. This is not something that's transitory. Yeah, it's, it's not. Yeah. yeah. But and then you had to respin your 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 whole image, right? You've yeah. got a brand now, and you're like, yeah, I'm no, I no longer match the brand. <laughs> yeah, and that's you know, and we do that as like just human beings. We we create our own brand every day. We walk around creating our own brand, our own identity, what, who we are as people, and the idea of like being willing to change is so hard for so many. Like to accept that there's a new future, to accept that there's a new possibility. We get so caught up on like a a path and we think that we're failing by deviating from that path when we're actually just becoming more honest mm -hmm. and more of ourselves by exploring other areas of our life. And also that your brand can survive it. I mean, I keep thinking about when you're talking about that Madonna, right? Yeah. Somebody who reinvented herself over and over and over again, you know, and maybe she was finding new things in herself and maybe she just recognized, you know, what connected with, you know, the, the, um, the culture as the culture evolved, yeah. right? But it doesn't matter. The point is, is that you don't, you know, maybe being stuck in one thing isn't even the best thing. No. Like your brand may eventually get left behind, but that is kind of remarkable that you had a second uh, time where you had to then bring out, you know, sort of the, your truth again, Yeah. right? And, and that's, uh, you know, a remarkable opportunity for you, but it is back, goes just back to being authentic, right? That yes. authenticity is part of art. Authenticity is part of brand. You know, it makes a brand engageable. Makes and people person. notice, people can sense it. We all can sense when something's authentic and when something's honest. If, if you don't mind, I'm just thinking back to when you were saying uh, it was, you know, during the editing, you were watching yourself and it was really tough and reliving all those things. And I just remember where they asked Tina Turner about her movie. You remember the movie Ike, I think it was, oh. uh, or Tina, I forget. And they were like, so what did you think of it? She said, I didn't see it. And and they were like, why? She said, I lived it. I really did not need to see it again. Oh, right? yeah. It was a film yeah. about her. It wasn't her film about her. It was just, it could have been absolutely true, but she... She was just like, yeah, I don't, I don't need to relive that stuff, right? It is really, really hard. But if you're gonna, if it's gonna be your story, you had to have that that third phase of that art form, yes, so that you yeah. could, you know, really show your truth. Absolutely, yeah, you have to be able to show up there. It's not, it's, it's different when you're like acting into something or when you're just stepping away or someone else's project. But it's all you. You have to follow it through the whole process. I'm just so fascinated with film that I'm like getting dragged right off in that direction. I forgot that you also have HIV. So tell us, you know, what it's been like dealing with it. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's such an interesting thing. I think um, there's a lot of misconceptions about it, where we are now. It's like such an, it's such a psychological battle more than it is a physical and if you're privileged enough to be on medication, if you're privileged enough to have access to be healthy, to have be undetectable equals untransmittable, suddenly the battle of HIV becomes the stigma, becomes the psychology of it, becomes 
not making it run your life. You know, um, I've been on drug trials since I was a child. I've been on every medication you can possibly be on. I was um, born a twin. And so my twin brother and I were put on the first HIV infant study under Dr. Fauci in the National Institute of Health. Mm. And so we've been in there from from the from the beginning and um unfortunately my my twin brother passed away at 16 months um he got very sick and he developed pneumonia and so and because they tried different medications on us the medications that he had gotten as opposed to the ones i got weren't as strong they wanted to test the same dna and see what the effects were in the blood and so um, you know, we, uh, you know, I made it through that process and through other HIV meds and going through life and worrying about whether I was going to be here or not. And eventually at some point you realize you are here and you have to do something with that. And I think that's when the battle changes. That's when it's no longer a physical battle. It's no longer, you know, worrying about being sick. It's worrying about having a family. It's worrying about creating a sense of a career. It's worrying about all these things that you get so used to as someone with a chronic illness or a long-term illness not having because you're like, well, that is a nice future. That's a nice idea. Probably won't be something that's in my future. Probably won't be something I can grasp. And so you have this passenger mentality in your own life because you're like, oh, I'm, I'm not really here. I'm not really here. And one day I had to just sit there and be like, no, I'm not going anywhere. So I better figure out what I want to do and what I want from my life now. And that can be such a struggle. And then developing your own sense of self, why I talk about honesty so much, and then how you affect relationships and what it affects in your life and your love. You know, when I started finally opening up to people and being with other people, then I had to deal with the fact that I knew personally I couldn't affect them. I was untransmittable. I was undetectable. It doesn't matter scientifically, those things. When it's up here and you know that you're a product of it, you know that you're a child of HIV, and you know that because your parents maybe weren't as cautious, that you could potentially affect someone else, creating a level of intimacy can be really hard, even with the right stuff and with the right meds, with the right protection, you just have to open yourself up and it can take time. And I had to really battle that throughout my 20s to get to a point where I'm like, I'm here, I'm safe, I'm not a weapon. I'm not gonna harm somebody. And that that person who's accepting me is accepting everything that comes with me. And that means that they want to be open with me. They want to be honest with me and we can have a full fulfilling relationship. It's so good that the, you know, the latest scientific information supports that so well, you know, you equals you detectable equals uninfectable. You know, this is a really important thing for the whole world to understand at this point that actually your chances of getting HIV from somebody that is well-controlled is lower than a random person that you bump into who might be infected and not know it. <laughs> Yeah. Or may not be treated, right? Yeah. You know, which is amazing to think that, okay, if you're sexually active, maybe, you know, people that are dealing with this in a very direct way are your safest bets, not your riskiest bets. Yes. You know, but that, but that's a real, like, flipping it in your head. I mean, I don't think that's the way that people uh, think all the time. But, uh, yeah, that's, uh, um, uh, I think a, a very important uh, observation, and it's really interesting to hear that journey that you went through it. Because you're in your early 30s now, is that about right? Yeah, I'm 33. Doing the math, right? Yeah, yeah, 30. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for for men, that's when life gets serious. I'll tell you from my own experience, and I, I love the idea. You know what you were saying is that you were you were thinking that you know your life was limited, and so you were the, a passenger. I think that's a great description. And then uh, you decided, you know, look, uh, the statistics are now showing that I keep being here the next day. And, and you know, this could be longer than I think. And I've always felt that that's, you know, the very important in terms of, you know, living a full life is you do have to recognize that your life could end any time. But you still need to plan for if it doesn't, 
yeah. right? You need yeah. to decide, well, what am I going to do with it if it turns out to be a full life, right? And most people don't have to think about it in such a stark way as you did, right? Or even can recognize the transition that when their head shifted from, you know, uh, you know, sort of unlearning the idea of your the fragility of your life. You had yeah. to unlearn that, right? Yeah, and usually then, it's the reverse. Everyone usually goes in the other way. They're like, oh, they have a, a moment and they're like later in life where they're like, wow, I'm not a Superman. I'm not infallible. Yeah. I'm not, for, you know, I'm not indestructible. I, and it's like, for me, it was the exact opposite. It was like, oh, I keep having these challenges. I'm less destructible than I thought. Exactly. <laughs> I, might, I might be here till age 80. Yeah. What do I want to do with that? If I'm here for another, you know, six decades, where do I want to be? And what a great, what a great start, you know, of going into film and, you know, and, and that might even have been a tool to, you know, sort of sort out everything in your head as well. Right. I mean, honestly, it was like, it, it, for me, it was like, okay, if I am going to be here and I'm running on like borrowed time or time that I wasn't even supposed to have, why would I do anything but do the most with it? Why wouldn't I not try to go into the career that is the hardest to get, like do the things that. I want to do and I enjoy doing as opposed to just kind of being here and not living it, not living up the moments that I'm given that I wasn't supposed to have. Well, you know, the theme that comes out and, I, and tell me if I'm stretching this point, but I find this a lot with the people that I talk to on the Cure Chronicles because we are being really open about life. But, you know, what I hear, the theme I hear is gratitude, right? You even use the word, if you have the privilege of being treated, if you have the pre privilege of being this, you privilege of your your um, rhetoric is full of gratitude, right? Yes. You know, you're living life with purpose in a way because you don't take life for granted. You're not looking at everything that came to you as like, well, that's the minimum. No, you're thinking my minimum could have been way worse, <laughs> which is a great perspective to have on life, no matter how good your life is. You, real, you start to recognize like your problems aren't really anything, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I always, you can always think of somebody cane. that has it worse. Yeah, yeah, I always looked at my cane and my disability. I always used to call it the great leveler. You know, it's like no matter how, how ego I want to get in here, I can never have too much of an ego because one day I'm, I'm still going to fall. I fall four times a day. I fall five times a day. You're still going to have those moments that are reality and you're going to be brought back to earth. And for me, like every day is like, oh, yeah, like I'm like, yeah, that I get to do this thing that I get to be here that I get to be an actor that I get to do anything like this is yeah. I'm never going to take it for granted because it could very well not be here. And, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely grateful. I think that is a good point to put it. Gratitude. Such, a, such an important perspective. I mean, that's just remarkable. And I'm sitting here talking to you, right. And um, if I had just met you, I wouldn't have any idea that you had any physical disability, right. And what you're doing is you're taking your talents, which you developed up here, right? And you're, you know, and, and this is, you know, potentially the most important muscle in your whole body anyway, really. I mean, think about Stephen Hawking, right? right? You know, that, you know, this was a guy who really had a broken body. And yet, you know, he was able to do, you know, really important and fulfilling things. And, uh, and we should, yeah, we should kind of, you know, deal with our challenges and figure out like what do we have and what can we do with that and then enjoy the ride as much as possible there will be sad days right i don't know whether do you ever have a down day i mean you just seem like a guy where uh, I, I wish you were around here all the time right you know with the with this positive attitude and that great smile and i'd be like oh this guy is you know he just lifts up the whole room when he comes into it but it can't always be just wonderful no, right it's a balance. And I, of course, have down days. I think it's one of those things where, again, life is just too short. And for me, it's like, there is a lot of negativity in the world. There's a lot of anger in the world. I don't need to personally add to it. We all know it exists. We all know that that stuff is there. I have my moments of reflect reflection. But for me, I want to do the most that I can with my perspective. I want to do the most I can with what I've dealt with in a way that's going to be productive, in a way that's going to be um, helpful for myself, because, you know, you can't live in that, um, especially with a physical illness or a, 
like a chronic illness. It's a mental game as much as it is anything else. And anyone who's dealing with chronic illness on any form, you have to be able to show up. And it's so hard. And it's not something you can tell anyone else but yourself. And so, you know, that you can fight through it, that you can be positive about it. You can go through life and, you know, you don't have to be bitter. And for myself, like, I don't, I never want to present that way. And I never want to be that way. There's always something it could be, you can always find something to be grateful of for that day. Yeah, I, I see what you're talking about also with all of the, you know, sort of emotions that are just on the surface in the world, sometimes just completely in a non-productive way. It's not, you know, it's not like the emotion you show in your film where it helps people to understand, you know, sort of a, another perspective. It's just anger. It's just finger pointing. It's just, you know, uh, putting up walls, right? Not 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 physical walls like the wall on the south border, right? You know, the idea of that, right? I mean, but the, the idea of walls became really, really popular, you know, over time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and yeah, that's a really sad, sad situation. I, I always try to have empathy for those folks, even the ones that are angry, because what I believe, and, and maybe, you know, through your art, you see this as well, you're coming the other direction through it, but I go, whatever I see in anybody else, I have the capacity for. It just hasn't been triggered in me. Yeah. It's maybe another way of saying, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go I, right? I'd be that angry. I'd be that big a jerk. I'd be that, you know, I'd be the one honking on the horn today if I'd had that person's day, right? Yeah. And it, it makes you realize like, okay, you know, um, you know, where you can let it roll off your back, you know, decide, you know, where what are the ones that are going to impact you? Sometimes we have to turn it back, right? You know, you can't, yeah. we can't give up democracy because a bunch of people are angry about, you know, the fact that we all get a vote, right? Right. That, that wouldn't be a good reason to, you know, go, okay, well, let's just compromise on that and give up democracy, right? Yeah. No, but, you know, the, the, the rhetoric, let's not, you know, let's not take opinions too seriously. Let's not, you know, uh, face down people that are angry with more anger necessarily. No, I mean, I, you, I mean, you don't yeah. know where people are coming from. You don't know what, they, like you said, you don't know what they're going for in the day. I always say um, people sometimes are like a bad parking uh, spot. And this is what I mean. You you show up, you ever show up in a grocery store or something like that, and you're showing up to a parking spot and you see someone and they're over the line and they're slanted. And you're like, how could you have even done that? How how did that happen to you? And there's only one spot left. And so you have to park next to them. But now you're over the line and you're slanted because of what they did. Then you go into the grocery store. And when you come out, that person's gone. And all that's left is your car slanted and off to the side and in a bad spot. And someone else clearly came in behind you and was like, what is this guy doing? Why is he like this? And we affect each other every day, no matter what we do. And we're only looking at the bad parking job. We're not looking at what it happened before or after that moment. And I think, you know, a lot of people exist in this way that we're, you know, we're chain reactions. Yeah. And so we just have to be able to step back for a second and say, I'm sure there, maybe there's a reason for it. Maybe I don't know it, but yeah. to accept that there's a reason for it. It's helps. a different kind of faith when you think yeah. about it, right? It's a faith in humankind, yes. right? That insulates you a little bit from, you know, just fe- taking it too personally. Yeah, it's a step before the anger. It's a step before, yeah. it's a breath. Take right. a breath. Okay, we don't know. You don't know where people are coming right, from. Right. No, that's a, that's a, that's wisdom. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I always thought, you know, like the more connection that we can make, you know, humans have this incredible ability to colla- communicate and collaborate and to connect on two levels, an intellectual one and an emotional one. And when they build coalitions in that way, they can move mountains. Yeah. And, you know, the problem is charismatic leaders can, you know, move mountains or destroy cities, right? You just, you never know what you're going to get when you get a leader and and they have that ability to connect. It's sort of like, a, you know, it is, it's a, it's a charisma, right? Yeah. And, um, but, you know, if we use that in the right way, um, you know, we can actually, you know, turn back global warming. We can yes. sustain the human race for another million years. You know, there is not a reason why the planet needs to run out, that we need to destroy each other. No, not at all. You know, it, it part, but part of it is what you're talking about is recognizing the bad parking job uh, is just being one of those things where, 
you know, this could be a series of consequences, right? That person pay, parked next to a bad one too. Yeah. And, 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 and there was a shopping cart that somebody yeah. left in my life. That's, but you know, the mistakes would make us just as much as the, the moments where we're not making mistakes. Um, I think about this, you know, I, I uh, so my, just to get into it, because you just shared something very personal. Um, but for me, you know, my father, who was the reason I became HIV positive, my father who had infidelity, my father was a man who had mistakes and he had addictions and he had struggles. And the biggest challenge for me in my life, I used to say, is my father was kind of the roadmap of where to not go for me. And I took that from him almost as much as a, that was the most father figure thing you could do for me was be like, okay, I'm going to follow the opposite direction of where you went in your life. And that's going to help with me. And then, you know, realizing as I got older and seeing him for being, like, I'm 30 now. And I think about like when he, he passed, when he was in his mid forties and, you know, early fifth, late fifth, uh, late forties. And I think about like when he, when I was born, he was in his thirties, like I'm in, you know, he was in his early twenties when I, like I am now. And it was just this thing of like, he's a human being. He had many mistakes, but sometimes in life, when you, you're faced with a big obstacle, you have one of two options. You either go up or you go down. My mom went up, my father went down. And it's so much harder to pull yourself out when you've done that. And to accept him for who he was and realize that he was just a man who has had faults and to give him that forgiveness was a big part of my growth. And, you know, we're not perfect humans. No one is. No one's perfect. And you have to be able to take your mistakes and learn from them and accept them. And I think we're all learning more from our mistakes than we do from moments of, you know, where we show up and we've done the great thing because you don't recognize those moments as much. They don't stay with you. The mistakes stay with you. And you can, if you face them. It's part of examining your life too. You know, it's yeah. that quote about a life unexamined is not worth yeah. living. I forget it was that Socrates or something like that. Look, the, you know, the, the reality is, is that if, if we're on a journey, right, and if there's anything that is bigger than life, right, yeah. then life should have some, you know, meaning to it. Now, you're not going to take your car with you when you die or your money or your jewelry or, you know, whatever. What you're going to take is your experiences and your emotions and all those things that you could understand would exist in a spiritual world, right? Yeah. And so, you know, where do we create value? It is in that learning, right? So it is worth thinking about all these things. Now, you did something that also I, I see that when when people have a suboptimum parent, <laughs> right, they will generally look at them and they'll either be, um, you know, Stockholm syndrome, right? Or they'll reject it entirely. And you right. said, okay, like I just learned from my dad what not to do, right? So you rejected it entirely. Were you ever open with him about, you know, that when you were getting together with him, dad? You know, yeah, when, when, I, when I thought about that situation, I was like, I'm going to do the opposite of what my dad would do. And was he supportive of, yeah, you have a better life than me, son. I love you, even though I don't understand you or I can't be you and you can't be me and, you know, whatever. Did you ever get that moment? So um, unfortunately, um, so he was very rarely in my life. Um, we'd go years without speaking and then come back and, and a few more years um in fact like I always said it was this thing where he had this like timer when we would have conversations on the phone it felt like there was a timer like a like a 60 seconds that he yeah. could have the conversation then he had to get off and I used to be angry at that when I was a teenager and when I was a child I was like angry I'm like why won't he talk to me and it took me into my 20s after he passed to realize that conversation with me hearing me seeing me was a reminder of the things he was doing that he did wrong. And it was just too hard for him. And that being in that moment was just too hard for him, that he wasn't willing to accept full responsibility. And the thing that I can do for him is give him that grace, give him that freedom to be like, I release you of this. I yeah. release you of this. Well, you're releasing yourself too of all that pain, right? And you I, know, yeah. Just, yeah. A big thing like, for me was I was going to, confront him about all this stuff I was 21 I was going to confront him and it was, it was like I'm going to go this Christmas I'm going to talk to him I'm going to have this moment we're going to have this closure I'm going to tell him how I really feel that's the way before, before so you I were like you you had the speech ready 
I had the speech. You had the PowerPoint slides and you walked in anyway. And he had passed a month before I got back home to visit him. Wow. And oh my gosh. I Again, had, you're blowing my mind here. I mean, yeah. Wow. Have you had a set of experiences? Um, yeah. Well, I think, you know, so in your family, you chose the 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 road less traveled the road less traveled turned out to be really good yeah. he was kind of doing you a favor by not being around <laughs> right because yes. you know he didn't become your model uh or he didn't have enough time where it sunk in maybe in a negative way um you he, he let what it. could have happened to me happen he let the negative he let the things that were he let the mistake eat at him as opposed to learn from it and so that was a big thing for me was just like, okay, realizing he's just, he was a fragile human being as we all can be. As we, yes, as we all can be, right. Wow, what amazing empathy. I think empathy also is one of the, the best human quality, right? Again, it always comes out through acting, right? And and I think that it can come out in daily life as we go ahead and engage with other people and start to get a chance to sort of feel their experiences and and uh, and make that connection. Yeah, I was also thinking like you were starting to talk about that you're 30 now and um, you know this was the age when your dad had you and and you were starting to kind of talk about you know your your uh, e empathizing you know with his his uh, arc right. And I thought you were going to, you know, say something about, you know, the challenge of what it would have been like to have kids for you today. Yeah. And, I, and it is interesting to me, like, I think kids are a tremendous amount of work and responsibility and, and uh, parenting is not, you know, just something that is trivial, like good parenting, you yeah. know, um, you know, I always think about it even here at work. I don't have kids myself, so I can throw myself 100% into it. But I try to recognize that, you know, we have to strike a balance between an incredibly demanding uh, uh, mission like what we're on here at AGT, right? And, you know, that you've got a personal life too. You've got to take care of your kids. You've got to be a good father or mother. I don't need to be that. I, I'm married, so I got another, you know, person that I need to consider in my life. But, not like kids, uh, and not like cats, like the cats, <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you can't leave the dog. You can't leave it all. Right. You know, somebody has no. to walk your dog every day, every yeah. day. I mean, I, I go for work on, you know, I, I, I was just dealing with this recently. My fiance, she's in uh, San Diego shooting a film right now. We're both actors and she's shooting a film right now. And I was up for a role in Los Angeles. So I was going to have to leave New York and we're sitting here trying to tackle, like we have four animals trying to find cat sitters and babies and like when we yeah. get to when we want to have kids which we do you know you have to think about that and it's like it's such a hard balance and you know wait till um, your cats uh you know need piano lessons and ballet exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then you now you've got a kid that's i always thought a dog is so much work that if you're going to go ahead and have a dog it's certainly good prep yeah. having a kid because oh, yeah. there is things that you you just cannot skip it for a day like you nope. you you uh the the water ball bowl runs out for your for your cat you know you forget to feed them one time that's not the end of it it's not even the end of your relationship with the cat the cat will yeah. get over it right and anybody can stop in once a day and make sure the cats are all right yeah dogs are you know between that and uh and uh, having a garden or shrubbery or something like that okay great training yeah mm -hmm. uh, well, um, yeah, once again, you know, this, this interview, um, you know, it was, it's fascinating to meet you. And again, you know, HIV has been really a minor uh, topic. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, I don't want to underplay it, you know, that, uh, you know, you really are out there and you are uh, pushing for a very important thing, which is to break down the stigma surrounding HIV and to help to create connection between all people, right? And this is a value uh, for, you know, our consideration of every other human being, right? It's the thing that, that makes us realize that immigrants are not a threat <laughs> to us, right. right? People that are not our same religion are not a threat. People that are not, not our same color are not a threat. All these things, it's a really important thing. But for HIV, it's a special challenge because, you know, when you think about the 80s, it being a death sentence, yep. right? Um, that, you know, the it wasn't until Hollywood made movies like Philadelphia, right? 
where the general public got introduced to the whole concept and, you know, they started to try to chip away at the, the wall between, yes. you know, the HIV uh, diagnosed population and everybody else to try to, but no, Hollywood's not making those movies anymore besides yours. No, well, right? And I think what's fascinating is, is in, we've gotten to an interesting spot with HIV and AIDS in general, where we went from it being the AIDS epidemic. We went from it being the things like Philadelphia and seeing these, movies to getting it to be undetectable equals untransmittable and we have all these resources and we have medications and it slowly kind of faded back that right. I think now where we're at the issue and I find it every day I'm on TikTok I'm doing social media I'm doing stuff where I talk about HIV and I find like you know Gen Z or like youth is almost not getting these conversations because we've gotten it to a point where it's so manageable that we're not having the historical significance. They might not even remember to have safe sex, right? right. They may it's not even realize that HIV would be something that's worth avoiding. Right, right? because it, now it's no longer it's this so invisible. Like, hot button thing. It's like, right. it's not the topic anymore. And I think we're in this weird space with it where we have to bring it back. We have to have these conversations. And it's just so, it's fascinating. I, 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 I'm still seeing a lot of people who are not, um, educated on this from all ages, you know. Look and at the misunderstandings over COVID. You know, HIV is like you know orders of magnitude more complex, and you know you try to get the same population yeah. to understand, you know, the the the, the realities of this. It's it's tough. It's okay. I I feel like I'm. It's, I joked about it a lot, um, but I feel like it's a full circle thing. Like especially with Dr. Fauci, I'm like I was a child of under Fauci. For the HIV and the AIDS crisis, and these the same rhetoric came up about right. what he was doing then to now, right. and to now with COVID, and it's just fascinating to be like, no matter how far we come, we always go back around. No matter how ahead we get, we always end up repeating things. History yeah. really does repeat. Yeah, it's yeah, I heard somebody say that history doesn't necessarily repeat, but it echoes, right? right. You know, and and it's true. Like, yes. If you don't learn from the past, you are doomed to repeat it. I think that that is, you know, and and we didn't learn from the HIV, uh, you know, st uh, epidemic. And then, in, you know, in COVID, you know, we relived a lot of the political and psychological, you know, trauma and stuff like that. And it was a wider audience. Hey, welcome yeah. to, you know, the, the, the world of people that, uh, you know, are vulnerable right? Yeah. You, you didn't realize you were vulnerable. And some people reacted to it. It's like, I will not be vulnerable. I will not kneel down to the virus. And and people who know HIV or any other virus are like, yeah, the virus, that doesn't really make any difference to the virus. Whether you're kneeling down, believe in it, don't believe in it. It's there. It's real. It's yeah. nature. I mean, knock on wood. I mean, I, and I think, and I kind of thank HIV for prepping me in this way, not to, you know, no pun intended, but yeah. knock on wood, I managed, you know, to get through so far. I have not gotten COVID. Once, but you're you can get the same vaccines that anybody else can get. Yeah, right? is your your immune system solid enough yes. that you can do that? Okay, yeah, yeah. Because people that have HIV really are basically you know have norm relatively normal immune systems, right? Yes. Uh, maybe completely normal immune systems. So yeah, they. But still, you know, at the same time, you're right. You know, it it, it sort of like puts a, a an idea of um, oh, what's the word that I'm I'm looking for in here? Like like viral hygiene yeah right? and it doesn't have to be ocd but the mm -hmm. idea of like okay yeah it's worth wearing a mask temporarily yeah maybe i'm not gonna go out to the club tonight you know uh, or go to the same number of parties or whatever or maybe i'm gonna focus more on my dogs and cats for just a little yeah. bit and let this thing boil you know and the people and people with disabilities people with chronic fatigue chronic pain have all understood i mean have had to deal with this in life in terms of choosing when we do things and we've you know, I talk about the disability community is one of the few minority groups you can join at any time in life. And people often don't acknowledge it until they are a part of it. And they don't, you know, show up to support the disabled community until they are in it. And they don't realize how easy it is. And I think a lot of people who've gone through the pandemic, who have gotten long COVID, who've now become part of the disability community really understand that now of like, you have to be involved in this beforehand and like realizing just how much of the world had to think about this stuff and had to think about, you know, their health and every day and the things we were doing and how we were 
managing buildings and you know I think about the audition stuff with film you know you talk about being really interested in film and it's hard for me to even imagine like yeah there were time periods where I was going for commercial auditions where 400 people are using the same pen every day signing in and there's no hand sanitizer on the table (laughs) you know like yeah of course like these spaces were, were were made to like have health problems occur well, I'm glad and, it didn't uh, it'll didn't stop you though. That's amazing that you, you know, so you've been able to continue your your sort of love of all this stuff, maybe oh, yeah. in a slightly dialed down way, but it, it's persisted. And you haven't gotten COVID. No, and I haven't gotten COVID. And actually, honestly, I mean, for a lot of people in the disabled actor community, it's opened up um more opportunities for them for some because it's like everything is now Zoom. Everything is now oh, yeah. self-tapes, everything is accessible. There were often times I'd show up to audition places that weren't accessible, that weren't made to, you know, have me get in there. Right. And so now you know, I, over the pandemic, I did three national commercials and I did, I, I auditioned from my living room and I booked them from my living room. Yeah. And kind of like, oh, you interesting. Know, yeah. You know, I was, I was doing LA and I was traveling and, you know, I would go to a commercial audition that would be about four minutes in the room but it would drive, I would drive an hour and a half to get to Santa Monica to find parking. I'd get in the room. We'd do the thing for four minutes and they'd be like, okay, thank you so much. And I'd be like, great. And now I'm on my way home for an hour to try to get back. Yeah, and how are you going to be at your best after driving an hour and a half, right? Exactly. Yeah. In a way, like here in your, your space, you yeah. can set it up and be ready for that thing. And then when it's four minutes, it's showtime, you know, yeah, you've and then already you're already centered you're yourself and, and you're good to go. Yeah. 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 Huh. Well, look, um, I could talk to you forever. Uh, let's do this again sometime. I mean, yeah. I'm just finding like the 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 uh, range of the subjects that we're going over and the ability to talk about philosophy and psychology and and all this stuff. Uh, you know, this is really fun for me. And I got to also sum up by saying like you're you're an inspiration for people that are dealing with an HIV diagnosis and also dealing with a disability you know, that you, you really are showing, uh, you know, sort of, uh, a, um, you know, by just your life that their lives, uh, can be great. You know, that the, this, these are not showstoppers. These are, you know, you're plan for that long life, decide what you're going to do with it. Everybody has limitations. You have some too. Okay. Within that, realm of stuff that you can do there's a tremendous amount of meaning and joy and um you know and it's not going to always be happiness and joy no uh, but at the same time it's not going to be all you know like your like your dad right that you right. said that just he went down from the experience and could never get back up again and your mother went up so you had two examples and now your example of that up direction as well i hope yeah, they shape you know, us these things shape us. That's all it comes down to is every experience, every obstacle shapes us and creates a person who we are. And the more experiences we have, that just means we're just shaped more. (laughs) We're just, we have more edges to us. More nuances. nuances. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. I, I, I hope everybody enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you you sharing this with us. Of course. Thank you. Thank you.